Welcome to the Chess Angle. This is not your typical chess podcast. If you're an amateur or club-level player, the Chess Angle is for you. Our content is aimed at busy adults who are serious about the game but have limited study time. Featured guests include both amateur and titled players alike. And now, here's your host, director of the Long Island Chess Club, Neil Bellon. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We have a return guest, Grandmaster Daniel Gormley. He was on about a month ago. If you didn't catch that episode, we spoke about chess improvement and a number of other great topics. That was episode number 96. I'll put a link for that in the show notes. And this week, we're going to be discussing the upcoming candidates tournament, the 2024 candidates tournament. And the winner of that event will, of course, play Ding Liren for the world championship. So, Danny, it's a real pleasure to have you back on the podcast. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, no problem, Neil. I mean, I just felt like it was going, obviously it's it's a fascinating event. It's going to be a huge amount of publicity about this event. So I thought it was worth talking about. Obviously, there is that kind of shadow uh, over it in, in terms of Magnus Carlsen isn't competing because he declined his spot. But it's still, I don't think that's going to diminish the excitement that people are going to have about who is going to, because it looks very, very wide open. What I'm going to do for our listeners, and I'm going to put some links that people can check out, I'm going to sort of set the table, and then I'm going to let Danny give his insight on some of the players, and there was a bit of controversy with the selection process, and then we can talk, you know, about actual chess and, you know, people's styles and who might win this thing. So here we go. We have eight players, and we have Nepo, who was the... FIDE World Championship runner-up. I'm going to use some nicknames. I hope these players don't mind me doing that. Pragna was the World Cup runner-up. And then Fabiano was the World Cup third place winner. Abasov got fourth place in the World Cup. He's replacing Magnus Carlsen because Magnus declined to play because he didn't like the format. Then we have Jarathi, who was the Grand Swiss winner. Hikaru was the Grand Swiss runner-up. And then Ferruja got in because of his rating. He had the highest rating for January. There was a bit of controversy with that. We'll talk about it. And then we also have Gukesh, who was the FIDE circuit winner. So that is how they all qualified. And they're actually changing the qualification for the 2026 tournament, the world championship, but we'll talk about that separately. So once again, Magnus was the FIDE World Cup winner, but he declined participation. And the players are going to be competing in a double round robin schedule, meaning each player will play everybody else twice, once as white, once as black. The time control is 120 minutes for the first 40 moves, followed by 30 minutes for the rest of the game. And there's a 30 second increment starting on move 41. Players cannot draw by agreement before move 41. I personally like that rule. And of course, whoever gets the highest score wins the tournament. And it is taking place at the Great Hall in Toronto, Canada. And that's basically the layout of the tournament. Again, I'll put links where you can kind of see all this stuff. Danny, let's start. There's a lot to unpack here. Uh, I want to start with the controversy around Ferruja because it's my understanding, and, and hopefully you can explain it because I only I'm following this in kind of bits and pieces. I know he had the highest rating for January, but there was some controversy because it was almost like he sort of had these sort of cherry pick tournaments to boost his rating. So can you explain to all of us what the whole controversy is? Well, essentially, originally it looked like Wesley So was going to qualify in terms of ratings. So obviously, I think as you've already explained, there's several spots available to for the candidates. And one of those is rate are done on rating. And uh, Ferruja was in a rating spot uh, only after he gained enough points by winning uh, some league matches. A lot of people on Reddit were trying to co- create a controversy about this. However, in my opinion, although maybe you could argue these matches were slightly contrived, firstly, it's a phenomenal achievement to get to 2750 or whatever, whatever Ferruja's rating was at the time. I think he had to get to 2760, 2770. 
you know, people don't realise the level you need to play. I mean, I've played players at this level. It's really tough. Like every move, you feel the pressure when you play them. I played Michael Adams, for example, on several occasions. We, I've had a couple of draws against him over the board. They were tough games. And obviously, I've lost a few times as well. I've analysed with him. You start to realise it's a higher level. Uh, it's a very high level. They calculate very well, these guys. They're very efficient. They see they see a lot and, and they're very objective. They move quickly. They put you under pressure because they move quickly. They calculate well. So it's a phenomenal level. So I think people are making more controversy out of this than really needed to be uh, done. Uh, but, yeah, just to explain that. So he had a, a couple of matches or two or three matches. One of them was against a guy called Chekhachev, who uh, is a former Russian player, I believe, and he ended up living in France. Now, funny enough, I heard a controversial story that apparently he was told by Kramnik in a bar that the World Championship match between Kasparov and Kramnik was fixed, right? Which is a bit of a, I don't know, I bet it was in a pub, right? So, and the story was that they were going to have several matches. There was a sponsor who was going to sponsor several of these matches. You know, the idea was Kaspar would lose the first one and then and then he would get his like rematch and then he would win. But then the sponsor got cold feet and decided to pull out. And he also claimed that the Kasparov of Anna match in 1995 was fixed. So it's interesting when you hear about this stuff. Now, obviously, this is a story from a bar. It sounds like the sort of thing that Bobby Fischer was coming out with. He claimed that a lot of these Kasparov Karpov matches were fixed. But yeah, going off on tangent, the reason I explained this story was obviously Chekhachev. The people in Reddit were, were claiming that he was involved and somehow these matches with Fruja were fixed. I don't even think they were. But on the other hand, if you're playing your countryman, Neil, and you want you, you essentially want them to get through to playing the candidates, don't you? Farouja's a countryman of Chekhachev. I think it would have been fairer if they had brought in somebody from abroad to play him because he's basically playing against people who essentially want him to qualify. So it does look a little bit suspicious. But he's got through, and I think he's got a very, very good chance of winning. But I don't ultimately think he is the winner. I've got somebody in mind who I think will win, or one or two names. I don't know about you if you've had any thoughts about who you think might be the ultimate winner of this. You know, I like Fabiano. I think now, again, I don't know as much about sort of the inside baseball with all this as some players, but I'm rooting. For, I, it's partly that I'm rooting for Fabiano. You know, he's a New York guy. I mean, I met him as a kid, I, I've spoken to his dad. And I just think he's coming in this as really a, a monster candidate. So I think I think Fabiano could easily take it. I mean, I'm rooting for him. That's just my own sort of maybe New York kind of bias. But uh, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, you're Italian, right? What is yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Italian bias too. Yeah, I am Italian, so I have. <laughs> yeah, I am. My name, my name, my name doesn't give the slightest indication of it. It's a long story, but anyway, I'm actually 100 percent Italian. Uh, even though I may not look it, I'm kind of fair skinned. That's the northern Italy, but yeah, I think it's an Italian New York Brooklyn thing that I'm rooting for uh, Fabiano. But what are your thoughts, Danny? Well, yeah, I've been watching The Sopranos recently. I mean, presumably you're a fan of that show, right? Oh yeah, I watched it. Yeah, when it was on, like actually on HBO years ago. Yeah, that was the big thing. <laughs> yeah, it's just an amazing show. But I've just watched it so many times because so many TV shows you get into and you're like, actually, that's not very good, and then you end up watching the ones that you know you enjoy, which is like Breaking Bad, Sopranos. But yeah, I feel with Fabiano, obviously he's got a fantastic chance. Uh, but what I would say is I don't think he's got a big, as, a big as an edge as people think. Now, if you look at the bookmaker's odds, I think he's about uh, 7 to 4, 2 to 1, which seems about right. But obviously then if you look at that, then he's more likely to not win than he is to win. The, the guy I've got in mind that potentially might win it, actually, is another American player, which is Hikaru Nakamura, I believe has also got New York ties as well, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. He's a New York guy. Yep. Yeah, and he's, yeah, I mean, he's looking good as well, for sure. Yeah, because I did, as she looked up, I did a little bit of research, because, you know, like I follow golf a lot, Neil, and in golf, they're obsessed with statistics. And in chess, for some reason, we're not that keen on statistics. Uh Probably because I, 
I've got an opinion about this, and I think I mean Kramnik's been coming up with these statistics recently about people in title Tuesday and everything. They all seem a little bit all over the place. Uh, but is obviously in golf they're very very stringent on statistics, very very you know they go on about stuff like driving distance and stuff like that. But I was looking at a very very basic statistic, which is um, if you look at all the players and you look at their their classical FIDE rating, you look at their rapid FIDE rating. And you look at their uh, blitz for their rating. So we ignore online ratings. Then who do you think has the highest accumulated rating out of all the players in the candidates? See, my first guess would be Nakamura. Nakamura is number one. And the reason is because partly because he's got such a high uh, blitz rating. But I feel with Nakamura, uh, a lot of it will revolve around um really surviving the opening phase i feel like he's not really going to go in trying to punish people in the openings he knows that his blitz skills are so good that if he can just get a game against his people and get like a 50 50 game he's going to really fancy his chances i think when it gets deep into the game but the danger is that someone like caruana who's phenomenally well prepared vidit maybe as well as another guy is very very well prepared they're going to put him under pressure before he's getting to get into that kind of end game phase into that late middle game where he really kind of shines, which is like a sort of tactical kind of mess. And I think Farouge is a little bit like that as well. I don't think he's a huge theory guy as well, but I think Caruana and Nepomniachtchi as well, actually, is a guy who's one very easy to forget about him because he's one of the last two candidates. And yet, we kind of just ignore him and think, well, he's probably not going to qualify. But in fact, he won the last candidates very easily. And it, the only reason Ding is the world champion right now is he actually lost the first game of that candidates, which I believe was held in Madrid, uh, but then came second. He, he just finished head of Nakamura. He came second because he came second and Magnus declined to defend his world championship title. That's why Ding ended up playing in that match. So uh, Nepomniachtchi, you could argue, is slightly unlucky not to be world champion already. Interesting. So in, in a lot of ways, this is this is sort of wide open, right? Yeah, I think it's very, very wide open. And I think one of the fascinating elements of it is, I would say, Neil, is uh, when you look at, it's actually probably the first time we've had a real clash of generations. So obviously you've got the older players who have already more established, people like Caruana, uh, Nakamura, um obviously a uh, it's a little bit uh different but nepomniachtchi would also be in that same kind of uh, generation uh and then you've got these uh people we don't really know how good they are which is uh pragananda who's a phenomenal player from india gukesh who's a very good friend of his and the same kind of age and these are the really representing this younger generation that are really starting to make a lot of waves now because obviously Gukesh very uh, nearly won uh, Vikan Zay. He's had some phenomenal results lately. And Pragananda qualified by the uh, finishing runner-up to Magnus. So if I asked you, actually, Neil, who do you think would... Like, if we go forward in a time machine five years in the future, who do you think out of all these players will have the highest rating? If we ignore the candidates and we just say, look, Let's go five years in the future. Who? Pragnanda. That would be my guess. Yeah, I would agree with you. And and I think, actually, he might even be by, by a large margin. I saw this game today he had against Keimer, who's another very good young player from Germany. And uh, they played some kind of uh, theory line, but it was just a phenomenal game. And Boris Averick put on Twitter, he said, he just couldn't believe this level of chess. This is a different level of chess Pragnanda's playing. Whether he's got the experience to win the candidates, it's interesting actually because if you go back a few years, Farouja was the guy that they were all talking about and saying Farouja is going to be uh, potentially uh, the best young player. But now it's much less clear because you've got these people like Pragananda and Gukesh who have broken in and kind of spawned. Actually, Gukesh is another guy I'd like to talk about as well. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I mean, Gukesh, uh, I just find the, the way he plays, if you look at Pragananda, uh, Kaima, uh, uh, this, this guy called Nordibrek Abdus Satarov from Uzbekistan, who's very good. But if you look at their style, they're kind of grinders. When you look at Gukesh, he's got a very exciting style. I, I looked at some of his games with Vikan Z, he's kind of playing this dynamic style. 
And apparently, um, I was reading the other day in this newspaper column by David Howe. He writes a newspaper column uh, in England for the, uh, I think it's something like the Sunday Times. And he was talking about Gukesh. And he said that uh, Gukesh kind of bucked the trend because it's typical nowadays for younger players to get good by working with computers. And he said that Gukesh got good by working with um just doing the traditional route of reading books uh puzzles so i think these two players coming in are potentially gonna uh, really kind of uh mix it up and that's what gives it a fascinating dimension for me the fact that we don't know how good these players are Farouja i'd probably put in that category as well i know he failed the last time but but I feel like um, Bragananda is the guy that they're going all in on. I feel like Bragananda, Indian, the Indian chess scene, they really want Bragananda to do well. Yeah. And I feel that they've put him ahead of Gukesh in the pecking order. Whether that's right or not, obviously only time will tell. But I feel like it would be a very exciting development if Bragananda was able to win the candidates, right? Interesting for everyone at home, what they're doing to avoid collusion, because we were talking about players from like the same country. So players from the same federation, they have to play each other in the first rounds to avoid collusion. So that would be, you know, Pragnahara, uh, uh, Guthari and Gukesh from India, and then Fabi and Hikaru from the US. Yeah. So they, they're going to be, I think if they face each other in rounds one through three and then eight through 10, so they want to avoid collusion. Well, yeah, I mean, that doesn't surprise me because as I just uh, said earlier, Neil, in the um, in the world championships, actually proper world championships um, themselves, uh, the people, there was some allegations that there was some fixing going on. Yeah. So, you know, if you feel like a whole match is going to be fixed and obviously one or two games... I mean, Bobby Fischer, going back to the 1950s, as far as uh, as long as ago as that, there was a famous story about him claiming that Russians were green draws with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was something like 1958 in Porter Rose or something like that. And he was claiming that uh, the Russian players, the Soviet delegation, people like Petrosian, who wasn't actually Russian, I think he was from Armenia, I think there were people like Korchnoi playing, and uh, Tao and a few others. I'm not sure about the names. And they were they were green draws with each other. And it, the idea of saving energy to play against someone like Bobby, uh, who would have been quite young at the time. He would have only been about 15. Uh, so this has actually been going on for years. I mean, I've seen this myself in tournaments. That obviously, uh, GMs would agree draws with each other for the game. I've done it myself, which is something I regret. I don't believe in fixing games. If we talk about Vikan Zay, that happened recently. Uh, there was a game in the Panama round between Gukesh and Pragananda, and Gukesh was winning that game. And at some moment where he was completely winning, he repeated the position, which I found very strange. Now, was that because he was under instruction not to beat the other guy? Is that possible? Or is it just because... Yeah, I mean, he just forgot, which is perfectly understandable. That he just forgot that he'd already repeated the position twice. But why would you even take that risk? Because he was totally winning, like pretty much any move would win. Um, so it was slightly strange, but I think uh, if we, yeah, I mean, you look at we're looking at Gukesh and Pragananda as being, I would say, probably the main host from India. Although Vidit, to be fair, Vidit has been playing some amazing chess recently. And he's got a, quite a big fan base as well. Often when I look at sports, you know, because I was I'm betting on sports all the time. I'm like crazy, you know, like a sports betting junkie. <laughs> I don't know if you ever you're looking at player upside, right? So a few years ago, I was looking at John Ram and he like in golf, and I could tell that he had like a massive upside, you know. And I was always going on about this on forums and stuff. And the thing is with Vidit, I do feel that his baseline is probably where he's at now, whereas the younger guys like Pragananda and Gukesh. We don't know where they could be in five or six years' time. They could be like 2,800 plus. I would expect Pragananda to be over 2,800 in the future, probably Gukesh as well. Given that, but obviously then you look at it and you think, well, Caruana is already 2,800. So the, the danger is that you could overestimate our potential. And so what is your feeling, Neil? Do you still feel that someone like Caruana has an edge over players like uh, Pragananda? It's hard for me to say because admittedly I don't have – as much knowledge about 
these guys as someone at your level. But I mean, from what I know, he, he definitely has a shot. It really, I think it's going to come down to endurance and, and, mm. and really style. And, and I, I'm just wondering what kind of, you know, openings these guys are going to use or how, you know, how much they're going to push for the win, that type of thing. I mean, I'm just sort of giving my sort of amateur perspective. I mean, from what I yeah. understand, I don't think this is going to be a boring. I mean, this should be a very exciting matchup because of all the varying styles. I mean, is that, would you agree that that's accurate? Probably. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting that uh, it's, you're saying that I didn't notice that they're, they're putting uh, people uh, from the same federation against. Basically, FIDE decided to have players from the same country play in the early rounds just as a measure to sure. avoid collusion. I'm not going to get into the specifics because I, I don't really know enough about that to make an opinion. That's just, you know, I mean, I guess they feel that that's just the state, but they're doing that for, for everybody, right? Exactly. They're doing that for all, you know, everybody from every country who's, who's playing together, they're making them play in the early rounds as a step to, avoid collusion because obviously if they don't meet until the later rounds it would be much simpler to agree to a draw i also like the fact uh what i mentioned before that they can't have a draw by agreement before sure. move 41 i mean sure you could argue that if two players really want to have a draw they can still work around that i mean at this level <laughs> you know they can play up to 42 moves i mean it's probably much more difficult i don't know but you know i, I mean i think these are good things to have in place yeah. uh to uh, you know at least prevent like in like a very easy ridiculously easy prearranged draw i guess that's what they're going for yeah i mean i i totally agree with you but i think the draw issue should be um uh absolutely i think that should be instigated in every tournament actually because i played a tournament in uh, guernsey which is an island uh uh just off the coast of england uh recently and uh had a quick draw with the two other strong players that were playing the tournament we, we all stitched the tournament up with six out of seven i didn't feel good about that and one game i played a few years ago in a, in a i i agreed a draw with a fellow grandmaster before the game and he said that the organizer was telling him off for green quick draws so he basically told me we've got to play out like 30 moves which i felt really horrible about and it obviously it feels you know, corrupt to do that. Um, and it was really, uh, you know, but unfortunately that's the reality of the situation. And I think you can avoid that by essentially having this kind of severe rules rule in every tournament. But coming back to what you were saying about the styles, um, yeah, I would ca categorise certain players in this tournament as being quite dynamic players. So you're looking at players like Gukesh, Verugia, um, to potential Nakamura as well, I put in that category as being quite a dynamic player. Potentially have explosive games. They could have phenomenal tournaments. Nepomniachtchi is kind of in that category as well. He's quite dynamic. They could potentially have phenomenal tournaments, or they could crash and burn. Uh, with someone like Caruana, who's more steady, and I would put Pragananda in that in that category as well. He's kind of very rock steady. He's not likely to lose many games. So we could have a lot of upside from someone like Ferruja, but the downside is if he starts badly, then he could potentially collapse. I mean, I think the fascinating, fascinating player for me in this tournament is Nakamura, and I really have a feeling that Nakamura is going to do something in this tournament. And partly is because the last candidates, um, which was, uh, that was in Madrid, right? I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, but I'm not sure. I don't have it in front of me and I don't remember. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think it was in Madrid because a friend of mine invited me to to, to go there. But I said, Look. yeah, a friend of mine because they're friends with Caruana, and I think they wanted to hang out with Caruana. But I uh, basically I didn't want to go because I don't like flying, and I thought you know if I go there, it's gonna it's hardly when I was looking at the photographs, there's hardly any spectators. There's like the spectators aren't really encouraged at these events. Actually, I do remember I think Bobby Fisher when he played against Petrosian. That would have been back in the 1970s, right? Okay. My chess history is admittedly not where <laughs> it probably should be. I'm going to say that sounds about right, but 
I'm not the person to ask. <laughs> yeah, I think it was 71. And because uh, obviously back in the day, Neil, they did it slightly differently. So they'd have candidates matches rather than uh, a candidates tournament. And you'd win a series of matches to get through to the final. And the, obviously, the, probably the most famous of that was Bobby Fischer. He crushed uh, Taimanov, which I believe that match took place in Vancouver. And he beat him 6-0. So obviously Canada's got a history, a famous history of candidates, because it obviously had that famous Bobby Fischer match. And then he played um Bent Larson in uh I believe it was somewhere like Denver. And then he went and he beat Petrosian in uh somewhere like Argentina, Buenos Aires. But I think they had a huge like crowd. I've seen pictures of it where they've had a huge crowd, but I think in this uh, kind of event now, really FIDE are looking for the online involvement. You know, that there's not a, ma a massive amount of uh, probably, there's not probably not going to get a massive amount of spectators. But yeah, looking at the players, uh, I feel like Nakamura, who came quite close actually in the last one, I think he'll learn from that. And he's actually taken a different approach now to these kind of candidates tournaments that he did before actually, Neil. I got a couple of random thoughts about this. I'm curious about your opinion. You're a GM. I'm an amateur. I kind of like that dynamic. It kind of gives a sort of a more broad perspective. So I'm wondering, like, Fabi Caruana, very solid. Very. I'm wondering if some of the younger guys are going to push too hard against him, and he'll just play like a rock and can win that way. Do you have any – am I – is that kind of a legitimate thought that I have? Uh, what do you think? No, absolutely. I mean, that comes back to what I was saying that a lot of these players, it's almost like a rock, scissors, stones thing. Like, right. Like, for example, there was a game uh, the other day in, in a tournament I was following, and there was a player called Tibi Ikov who was playing against a younger player called Jonah Willer. And I felt that was a good matchup for, for Jonah Willer, uh, for Tibi Ikov, because uh, Jonah Willer is a kind of dynamic player who plays uh, attacking chess. Tibi Ikov is like a rock. And this is a higher level, obviously. Uh, Tibi Arkob was a very strong player back in the day, still is, but he's not like top, top level like now. Caruana is top, top level. Um, but I feel that, yeah, I think with a lot of these uh, dynamic players, you know, a lot of their their strength is based on confidence. We've seen that with Gukesh. He's done very badly uh, in recent times in some tournaments because he started poorly, like Isla Man, for example, uh, where he could have qualified himself automatically. He had to wait on the kind of tournament thing. If he'd have had a good tournament, he would have qualified anyway. Uh, so he had to go to Chennai to qualify, and Vidit ended up getting at the spot. Uh, but he started very badly there, and he was losing to much lower-rated players. Uh, so he can't afford to start badly. And I think the same with all these kind of players like Ferruja, Nakamura, you know, and who was the other guy I said was quite dynamic? Possibly Nepo Niachi, right? Yeah, yeah, Nepo, definitely Hikaru. I feel like Caruana could start badly, maybe like half out of two, but potentially bounce back, get on a run. But I think if those kind of players start badly, I don't think it's going to end well for them. And yeah, so I'll be looking at, who starts well really like who's gonna kind of is this somebody who's gonna like stamp their class and potentially maybe get out get off to a good start with like two out of two or two and a half out of three what i noticed i don't know if anyone bets on on it but one of the things i've noticed um you actually if you are going to bet on individual games you're actually better off waiting to the end of the tournament because players will be demoralized at the end because they know they can't qualify and the players are in contention to win, you're often getting quite generous odds. Like they'll still, the bookmakers will still favour the draw heavily, even though one player might be a back marker, might be demoralised. And then someone like uh, Caruana is surging ahead. He's probably going to pick him off with white or with black. But yeah, I, I feel like um, if there is kind of a bit of dynamic where you're going to get an upset, it's probably going to be from someone like Pragananda, who's got potentially, I think he could be like top, one or two player in the world in a few years. He could steal the show. I mean, he could totally steal the show for this event. Yeah, I think so. But he lacking experience, but he he there's something about him that he's got a lot of self-assurance. And when you see interviews with him, he almost seems like quite an intellectual character uh, compared to a lot of chess players. Um, whereas Nakamura is more like the street fighting kind of type, right? 
like the way he talks, he's kind of, you know, brash. He's, he's, he's playing title Tuesday, doesn't really care. So, yeah, I think interesting dynamic. But, yeah, I feel like, have we covered all the players? We, we talked about this. How many? There's eight players, right? We have. Let's see. Yeah, we spoke about Nepo. We spoke about Pragnahata. We spoke about Fabi. Maybe you can say a little bit more about Abasov. Yeah, he's not a player that I know particularly well. I mean, one of the things I feel like is important is how well you prepare. Now, someone like Caruana, we know he prepares very well. He works very hard on chess. Uh, he's got a team. He has training camps. He's talked about that quite openly. He doesn't try to hide it. I mean, actually, some of these stories coming out of his training camps, I remember a few years ago when Carlson played Caruana, uh, Carlson played somebody like a like a world-class grandmaster. I won't mention the name. And he beat him in a 30-game blitz match, 28-2, which is insane, right? Yeah, <laughs> that is crazy. You're talking about a 2,600-plus player who's been over 2,700, beaten 28-2. So these guys, they take their training camps really seriously. What I find interesting, Neil, is that Nakamura, um, he he actually talked about when he first played the Canada, so I'm not sure when that was. It might have been something like Moscow 2012 or something like that. He over-prepared. He, obviously, it's the first time he was there, and he was taking it really, really seriously. It's a bit like, like Rory McIlroy sometimes. He'll play the Masters, uh, the golf, and he, he only needs the Masters to complete the career Grand Slam. And last year he turns up and he was like, he turned up like two weeks before the tournament started. He was there like two months before playing practice rounds, but he's working himself up. He's getting himself too worked up. Nakamura recognized that. He said, well, you know, I, I, try, I, I sort of tried too hard in 2012. So the last one where he played um, in, uh, uh, we, we, we already talked about, it was in Madrid. So that would have been 2022. He's already a streamer. He's making good money from that. He doesn't care. He doesn't really care about the money. It's more like, I'm here to enjoy myself. Let's have some fun. He was doing video recaps of his games on YouTube, which I think was a good thing. Again, that's kind of taken away the stress. It's very stressful for these guys, right? I know these guys are very strong players, but if, you, if you're if thinking about it, there's a world championship match on the line, which is potentially life-changing. Yeah, and it's all eyes on. Now I can't imagine the pressure. Now... How do these guys, like when they train, because I feel like when you hear about this, it seems like they work mostly on openings and studying their opponent's games. Is, is that what their training consists of or is it is it more than that? Like, can you share with us at the amateur level, like what exactly does, say, the six months before this starts? Like, what exactly are they doing? How are they spending their study time? Well, unfortunately, Neil, I've never been invited by a super grandmaster to take part in their training camp. Probably because they regard me as an obnoxious character. We'll have to fix that. I'll put a word in for you, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But the thing is, uh, yeah, so what would a training camp consist of? Let's imagine. I mean, you know, a lot of this has been talked about openly anyway, so it's been discussed. Essentially, you're sitting down, you're playing against um, people who are uh, maybe other seconds. So you're playing training positions maybe, and, and the other person is coming in. And then, you know, the, the player it, themselves is coming in and potentially uh, playing some of these training positions. I mean, I, I spoke to John Spielman, who was uh, a few months ago, and we randomly were talking about uh, uh, something to do with this. And he was talking about how he was the second for uh, Nigel Shaw during, during a match against Kasparov, which was 1993. And then he was also second for Vichy Anand in 95. It was actually, that match took place in the ill-fated uh, World Trade Center, I believe. Uh, I think it was near the restaurant. It was like a restaurant called The Windows on the World or something. I'm not an expert on but, but, but yeah, it took place in that uh, trade center. And he was the second, but he said he didn't have much contact with Anand. He would give kind of positions to the to the main person who was in charge. I'm not sure if it was Dvoretsky or somebody else. And they would pass it on to Anand. So, yeah, it might just be that it's just a lot of people beavering, around, beavering away. And you're coming in, you're the player, and you're coming in. You you know, if you're an Akamura, you're playing video games all day. You come in, you see these printouts. I mean, I heard that about, I think, I think Karpov said he was like the, um, he was on the training camp of Boris Spassky way back in 1972. Because Karpov, by that point, would have already been one of the best players in the world. 
uh, even in 72, but he wasn't very well known outside of, uh, you know, in the West, outside the Soviet Union. Uh, but obviously in Russia, they knew he was very strong. So they brought him into the Boris Spassky uh, training camp. And he said he couldn't really believe how uh, laid back Boris Spassky was. And he said Boris Spassky's kind of attitude was, you know, I just have a fresh mind. I come in fresh. Don't over prepare. But he said he essentially didn't take part in any of these kind of training sessions that they had. Uh, he would just sort of turn up for the tennis, the ping pong or whatever. And that was partly, he said that was partly to blame for uh, the reason why he failed. Whereas Karpov, on the other hand, when he was preparing for these matches in, say, 75 against Korchnoi, he was spending 12 hours a day studying chess. So if you're spending 12 hours a day studying chess, Neil, partly the reason why Bobby Fischer actually won the World Championship title in the first place, he was just chess, chess, chess every single day. So we spoke about the alleged controversy with Ferrugia and, you know, some people claim he sort of like artificially boosted his rating or that those matches were somehow, you know, contrived or staged, whatever. That's just what's out there. I'm not, you know, giving my own opinion on that. This is just what's being reported. So, but now what about with Gukesh? Because I'm following this, but I'm sort of, it's, it's a little, not incoherent, it's a little vague how this went down. Cause they say with Gukesh, there might have been a little bit of controversy with that whole FIDE circuit winner because it goes by, you know, how you do at a series of tournaments and there's this formula. What what's what's the deal with that whole thing with the FIDE circuit winner and Gukesh? Because I know there was some kind of issue with that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this stems from the fact that obviously with the candidates, there's only a limited number of places and there's so many very good players now. And you could look, you know, you look at players a few years ago, so oh, they're bound to play X amount of candidate matches. But actually they're not because uh, there's so much competition. So it's not easy to get in these things. So like Wesley So was having bot shots at Ferrugia online. As far as Gukesh is concerned, I think one of the things with Gukesh and Pragananda, which is probably not talked about enough, is the fact that they work together. So the fact that these Indian guys, they're, they're dragging each other along. So you've got, obviously, Vidit is slightly older than those guys, uh, but they have training camps which are based on um, on the old Soviet training camps of kind of communal, uh, they're all training together. I mean, I've spoken about this, Neil, uh, with English chess, and one of the reasons I feel that we've fallen behind other nations, obviously you can't compare yourself to countries like India and the United States and uh, China because they've got much larger populations. Uh, but we used to have a very strong chess nation. And but we kind of like, on the, we really, all our good players were really based on a kind of lone wolf philosophy, which Bo Bobby Fischer also kind of adhered to. But I think now that doesn't really work anymore. I feel like uh, we've seen countries like India forge ahead because they're, they're working together. They've got people like Gukesh is working with Prangananda, who's working with Eragatsi, and Neil Haisarin is involved. Um, that's another player who I think might be involved in candidates in the future. I mean, if we look at these players, who would you say could potentially be world champion? I mean, who could potentially beat Ding? Because that's what it's all about, really. I mean, you could talk about the tournament, but it's ultimately about getting somebody from that tournament to then face Ding. Now, who who are the players involved, do you think, can can beat Ding Liren? There's a, like an X factor with these things that you just don't know. I mean, just just based on statistics. I mean, I mean, definitely Caruana, definitely Hikaru, definitely all the all the ones from India. I think. I mean, definitely. I, I don't know. Like this is what this is why I'm having you on because I <laughs> th these these are things that I I follow. You need a ding. You need a ding expert, right? Yeah, I need a ding expert, right? Exactly. So I'm, but I mean, yeah. I mean, I th I think uh, Abbasov could. I think Absolutely. a lot of times Absolutely. there's. Uh, just, I mean, look at how the last world championship went down. I mean, it was like a street fight, right? It was like back and forth, back and forth. It wasn't like, you know, that's, that's kind of why I'm saying like anybody, it wasn't like draw, 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 draw. Do you think we'll see like a French or a London system? Is that even possible? Someone's going to throw that out? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Well, London system, I think is fairly sound. Certainly Nakamura will experiment the openings. And if he feels that he can avoid people's preparation, I feel with him, 
his talent level is on a par with anyone's, possibly even including Magnus. If he can get a position where he can play, the problem for him is sometimes the openings, particularly with Black, can be a little bit suspect. And that is where people will be looking to get him because they'll realise that he's probably not preparing as much as other players. So there could be some vulnerability. But again, it could just be like a front. Like he could be doing a lot of work behind the scenes that we're not aware of. He's not on, he's pretty much online 24 7, but you know, there are a few hours where he's not online. But going back to the Ding thing, is there a player who can defeat Ding? I think Ding is a very proud guy, actually. I don't think he will be as easy to beat in the final as people assume. I mean, I was chatting with a friend of mine uh, called Richard Per, who's an IM who's based in England. and He married a, a Chinese woman, so he spent some time in China. And he said to me a few years ago, this is before... Uh, uh, you know, Ding uh, became really strong. He said, well, Ding Liren is going to become world champion. I'm saying, you're crazy, right? There's no way he'd beat Magnus. Obviously, I didn't know at the time he wouldn't have to beat Magnus to become world champion, right? Uh, but he said in, in China, Ding was a massive um, star. And actually, I think China, it was interesting reading about it. And apparently, it goes way back to the 1970s where this uh, Asian businessman, uh, obviously saw the kind of effect that Bobby Fischer had. I think Bobby Fischer came over to the Philippines. Uh, there was a bit of a craze in Asia about chess at that time. And he capitalised on that and he built on that and he decided to create a chess school in Asia and also in China. And Ch how China be became good is essentially was based on the old Soviet school where they would uh, get the stronger players together and they would train together. And also, like the female players, that's why the female players in China were had such powerful uh, women players and women teams and winning Olympiads. It's because the women players would often train with the twenty seven hundred guys, so they'd get that. You imagine if if you were training with a twenty seven hundred player every day, you're going to improve, right? You know. And I, I, I mean, I, I would, I would imagine I'd improve a lot. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not on a level with people like Nakamura, people like Caruana. I played against some of these players. I played against Nakamura actually in um, in the Isle of Man, uh, not the Isle of Man, sorry, in Djibouti uh, many years ago. And we drew, but he was quite young then. But the thing about Nakamura that impresses me is his level of self belief. And when he plays, even the way he moves the pieces and presses the clock, it's just with a huge amount of self assurance, which is something I think we can learn something from because he's just got that kind of you know, really kind of assurance, all like his body language, all this kind of... So I feel like I'll be looking at Nakamura a lot at the start to see if he gets off to a good start. But if Nakamura got to the final against Ding, I'm not convinced he'd beat Ding. I think Ding would regard Nakamura as quite a good opponent. On the other hand, he would have all that self-confidence from qualifying for the candidates. Caruana, though, on the other hand, I think I'd make a slight favour. He's the only player, actually, out of all that lot who I would make a favourite against Ding. Everybody else, I'd say, was would be the underdog. That's just my personal opinion. Just a step away from the candidates. Now, what's going on from what you've heard with Magnus now? I mean, is he like, you know, is he ever going to come back and, and try to play for his crown again? Or is he just kind of just enjoying what he's already accomplished? Like, what, it seems like he has no interest in, but I mean, people obviously would love to see him come back and try to regain his title like what have you heard about that yeah because i think this really strikes at the heart of the whole issue that is going on in chess because obviously recently we had this um uh sort of uh, random tournament where they randomized the pieces and start a game i think it was called uh freestyle chess i think yeah this uh freestyle uh, what's the other term for it i will just tell the listeners i am not a big fan of variance no, I'm with you. I'm with you, Neil. I don't like. I I particularly don't like Chess Nine Sixteen. Uh, Bobby Fischer created Chess Nine Sixty because he understood uh, that um, chess was getting played out because there was too much theory. And I've heard interviews of him a few years before he died, where he said chess is a horrible game. There's too much theory. It's become a memorization contest. Well, he does have a point, and this is the, the reason why Magnus, I think, pulled away from the World Championship match because. Essentially, to play in a world championship match, you've got to spend several months preparing uh, with powerful neural network computers. 
Uh, and essentially, a lot of the games, you end up neutralized by your opponents. Also, very, very powerful preparation with several team members. Yeah, that is a problem. And Nepomni actually, in a recent interview, also said that uh, he felt that chess was like classical chess will be dead in five years. Just to be clear on the terminology, I kind of looked this up while you were talking. Yeah, chess 960 is basically freestyle chess. If what I'm reading here is correct, they're basically interchangeable, which again, I'm just not into that scene. I guess I'm a purist. I just like... It looks ugly right now. I mean, it looks ugly. And the thing is, I do I do like a local school and it's almost like you're teaching them, don't put the bishop there, right? Or you, you put the king in the wrong square. And now you're like, actually, what am I supposed to say to them? Because apparently you're not supposed you're supposed to mix it all up. Yeah, because I, I feel like but I feel that the reason why it's become popular is almost like a sense of desperation because they do feel that computers are becoming so strong. And I think that is a valid uh, argument. Um, however, what Magnus wanted to do was quicken up the time controls. So he said that uh, I don't really see myself getting involved in the world championship as it stands now now you could potentially say look let's make the candidates to world championships i mean a few years ago uh you know if you go back well quite a few years ago now it would have been like around about the 2000s and maybe 1990s uh they turned it into a knockout and they had like a knockout uh world chess championships in las vegas almost like a world snooker you know like in world snooker you have like a knockout world darts you have a knockout and you get Tennis as well, obviously, in the Grand Slams, you get to the final, which has some validity. But the problem is that because the matches were so short, it would randomise it. You wouldn't necessarily get the best player coming through and winning. You had players like Halifman winning, who wasn't regarded as up there with Gary Kasparov or Kramnik or Anand. You had Morozevich winning, who's a very strong player again, but it wasn't regarded as like one of the super elite. The candidates, I think, works very well. People enjoy the candidates. But if that was for the world title, I think Magnus's argument would be that um, you'd still get too much preparation then because obviously people would know that the ultimate prize is going to be world champion at the end of it. You get a lot of games played out to draws. I would actually still argue, I think it would actually be better, um, it would be better for the world championship if they actually turned the candidates, which for me is a more exciting event than the idea of watching somebody play somebody else for like 18 games or however many games they play, 16, 18 games. For me, the world, the world, the candidates is actually far more exciting. I don't know. Did you, do you feel the same way, Neil? That's interesting. So in other words, whoever wins the candidates is world champion. Yeah. And I think, I think as long as you had um, like carefully laid down criteria, but I think the argument would be that Magnus would, would still not come back. Because I think that's really the elephant in the room uh, as far as the, the elite of chess is concerned is Magnus Carlsen is um, obviously the best player in the world. Nobody doubts that. He wins title Tuesdays. He's winning a lot of events. He's a phenomenal player. He's been the best player by quite some margin uh, for several years now. If you had the same situation, it'd be like uh, Novak Djokovic not taking part in any tennis tournaments. Of somebody saying I'm world number one, even though Djokovic isn't playing in the Grand Slams, he's just playing in the regular tournaments. It'd be like uh, Ronnie O'Sullivan in snooker not taking part in the world championships. He is by far the best player in the world. So the fact that he doesn't take part in the world championship, in my opinion, does obviously take away from it. You could say, well, look, nobody's better than the world championship. Nobody's better than chess. Nobody's bigger than chess. But equally, you could argue that Magnus is bigger. You know, he's the best player in the world. But I did actually make, I, I wrote a, um, or collaborated on a, ro- uh, on a book, sorry, uh, for uh, in- Infomart. I don't, if you, have you heard of Infomart magazine, Neil? I am not familiar with it, no. No, it's, it's a, quite a sort of famous Yugoslavian magazine. So in the days before people had databases, um, they used to drag around these Infomarts because they'd have these very deeply annotated games, in particular openings, so people who didn't have access to databases back in the 1970s or 1980s, they'd have these huge books of filled with these sort of very densely annotated Infomart games. Uh, but yeah, I wrote, I, I did some games from the uh, Carlson Nepomniachtchi match, and I said that Carlson was reaching the age where a lot of world champions would lose their title. Like if you look at uh, Kasparov, for example, he was a dominant chess player. 
but he lost his world title when he was kind of like in his late... How old was Kasparov in... He lost to Kramnik in about 2000, year 2000, I think. And I think he was 37. He would have been about 37 at the time. Uh, Bobby Fischer, obviously, he didn't defend his world title, but but Karpov, who inherited it from him, would have been in his 30s when he lost to, to Kasparov. Karpov was also... Yeah, we talked about Karpov. Boris Spassky would have been in his 30s. But what would be fascinating for me is because Carlson is so far ahead of the pack, if he was involved in a world championship, would he be able to fend off players like Pragananda? I feel like with him out of the picture, Neil, I don't know if you agree with me. I, I mean, maybe Caruana wins his candidates. But I think it's only a matter of time before people like Pragananda qualify, people like Gukesh, that generation of players. It's only a matter of time before they get somebody into the world championship final. But partly I'm also looking, I don't know about you, Neil, but I'm partly I'm looking at the song about Caruana's chess. I know you probably won't, because obviously you're a Carolina fan. You probably won't appreciate me saying this, right? It's okay. <laughs> All points of view here. All points of view. Exactly. Exactly. Right. There's something about his chest that just doesn't excite me. I just find it like it's a lot of it is preparation based. He's a phenomenally well prepared player. He calculates very well, uh, from what I'm reading. But his chest is kind of stylish. It's it's almost like it's it's been in, informed by the computer a lot. Uh, there's not many games I can quote of Caruana's. But then, to be fair, there's not many games I can quote of Carlson's either because the games that I remember, the games from when I was growing up, when, you know, people like Kasparov, you know, sound like a bit of a dinosaur now. People like Kasparov, Kramnik, obviously Anand, th those kind of guys, or even like Bobby Fischer games that I studied when I was younger, uh, Karpov. But, yeah, with Caruana is kind of... I just feel like if Caruana played Ding... To me, that just wouldn't excite me. I mean, I just wouldn't feel like that's an exciting match. And the reason is not just because of the chess, but also because of the personalities. Like, you've got two quiet guys who are quite introverted, right? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, but if you had Nakamura in the final against Ding, when Nakamura is kind of like a bit of a, you know, like up and down guy, a bit more outgoing, a bit more exuberant. I think you've had Nakamura, or, or if, uh, alternatively, if you had Pragananda, you had like, then you could hype up the whole India versus China angle. See, now, Caruana Ding, I mean, from what I remember, I mean, Ding, when he played Nepo, I mean, he was, he was pushing the envelope, right? He, he was, Ding, Ding was throwing down. I mean, Ding wanted to throw down. He wasn't like, you know, that match wasn't like draw, draw, draw. Fabiano's sort of like, solid preparation style against you know ding kind of trying to push things i mean that might be i don't know it might be an interesting match maybe i'm wrong no no i think actually if you if you look at there's two players here for me who have unfinished business with all the championship title and the two players are nepomniachi and caruana and and the reason is well caruana in 2018 was very close to beating magnus and he was kind of magnus admitted afterwards the press conference they felt there was very little between them at classical chess. Um, he got he got him in the in the rapid play section, but I think that Caruana he must regret in a way not taking more risks during that match because, for example, even in the final game he could have played on. Uh, there were certain games he should have probably won in that match. He has been one of the best classical players. You take Carlson out of the picture, you would say that he's actually the best classical. player chess player in the world right oh yeah no question right so given that that's been the case for at least the last 10 15 years you would have to say that this is a fantastic opportunity for caruana uh to potentially become world champion however i do kind of have that feeling he's not going to do it and i have this sneaky feeling that nakamura is going to qualify and that would be really a massive I think there would be a huge amount of hype if if Nakamura... Again, it's about the start. I'm, I mean, the thing is, predicting chess tournaments and predicting even individual results is a very, very tricky business, Neil. Yeah. No, there, there's definitely sort of an X factor. Now, I want to end with one final question, okay? Because this, this was a fun discussion. We kind of went in a lot of different directions. Because I'm thinking about Fabiano and losing. What are your thoughts for the World Championship? Because I'm not a fan of this of having rapid chess as the tiebreaker because mm. to me that sort of defeats the whole purpose i mean i get you could argue it can go on and on forever but do you have any thoughts on that on the fact that 
they use quick games to decide a world champion? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the rules actually, uh, Neil, uh, sorry to give another boring history lecture. Not at all. Go ahead. But they go back. Okay, one of the rules, well, uh, which was eventually taken away, was that um, Botvinnik had this rule basically put in where if you lost a world championship match, you'd be entitled to a uh, immediate rematch. So the world champion lose their title, they'd be entitled to an immediate rematch. However, that was eventually taken away. Um, the other rule that they had, which is that you'd have an unlimited match. And Bobby Fischer in nineteen uh, in the 1970s, I believe it was something like 1974, 1975, he submitted a list to FIDE of uh, conditions that he would need to play a world championship match. And one of those was um, that the winner of the uh, the world championship would have to win 10 games. And, and, and the challenger would have to win by a two-game margin. So if the score was 9 all, then the champion would essentially uh, retain his title because the challenger would have to win by like 10-8. But so essentially you'd have to win 10 games, right? Now, in the recent match between Carlson and Caruana, every game was drawn. So you can imagine how long that match would take place under the Bobby Fischer rules. It could go on for years, right? I mean, you had the customer. And the reason they they changed the regulations on this unlimited match was because of this kasparov Karpov match in 1984, which just went on for far too long. It went on for months, right into the Moscow winter. I believe they started in the autumn or something like that, maybe even in the summer. And uh, it, it went on for 48 games. Eventually, they decided this is going on too long. So that is the reason why they put in a tie-break situation. Now, what Magnus Carlsen wanted to do is kind of contrary to what you're saying, where you don't agree that a uh, classical thing should be decided. He wants to have it where you've got a combination of games where you've got some faster games and some classical games and he thinks that's a fairer way of deciding who the better player is um he also s stated that potentially you could have two games in one day if you have a faster time control in england i'm always moaning about the fact i've played two games a day tournaments magnus wants to play them. <laughs> part of the reason he wants to have two games a day is his incredible physical shape oh yeah he feels that he's just got much better stamina at than anyone else, which he has. So two games a day is probably going to suit him more, but it also suit the younger players as well. It's also going to suit people like Pragananda who don't get tired. They're not going to get tired because they're not. But yeah, this is partly why I talked about who's got a higher overall rating, because I think it would be ironic if someone like Nakamura, who I, in my opinion is probably disadvantaged by opening preparation, I feel like he's got a higher level of natural talent than someone like Caruana, who's a bit more of a workhorse, but he's not been able to show it because basically Caruana prepares well. So that's why Caruana is a better classical player. But overall, I think Nakamura is a better chess player. So that's why I feel like Nakamura is the better bet than Caruana for the upcoming candidates. But I think a lot of it would depend on how they start, Neil. I mean, you will have to monitor it and then you get a feeling for like, actually, who's got their eye in, who's actually looking strong. You know, there's no point in going when well, Nakamura is going to qualify and then he starts with sort of like half out of three, then you basically know you're done already. It's interesting. Well, they're both New York guys. They're both from America. So <laughs> that's my bias. Well, I'll tell you what, if, if Nakamura wins, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. And if Caruana wins, you'll, you'll buy me a cup of coffee. <laughs> buy, buy me an ice cream. <laughs> buy you an ice cream. Okay. That's probably, uh, probably less expensive. Price of coffee now is crazy. Jeez. Like a five five dollars or something. Yeah, well, yeah, a, a medium coffee. Well, a medium coffee in New York. This is just a plain coffee. It's, it's like three bucks. Yeah, I was watching a documentary about Mumbai the other day, and they, they had uh, apparently like coffee shops are just springing up all over the place. So they love coffee over there in Mumbai. So you ever go to Mumbai, you shouldn't be at, you shouldn't be struggling to get a coffee. I quite like coffee, but I start, you know I get really agitated. Like I get really agitated. Like if I have too much coffee, so I have to be careful. I threw the coffee away yesterday. How many cups are you drinking a day about? I don't actually drink that much, actually, but it's like um, last night I had like a cup of tea because I'm trying not to eat at night because uh, it's like I'm trying to lose a bit of weight. And I found I was just kept going to the toilet the whole night because it was just like 
it's like a diuretic, right? Right. It's caffeine's a diuretic. Yeah. I cut down. I mean, when I was in college, I was doing like four or five cups a day. Now I just do two. I have one when I first wake up, another like around 10 a.m. And you don't have one in the afternoon, right? No, I, I did. I stopped. Yeah, I have a my second cup is like ten thirty. Then I stop. I cut back a lot. But yeah, I mean the thing is, yeah, we're talking about the chess angle. But I do think the human beings, the player that will prevail, in my opinion, is a player who will handle their nerves the best, and will go into the games with the best attitude. Like who's the most relaxed player going in? That's why I said with someone like Nakamura because he does all this streaming now. I think he's in a very good spot right now. I think he's in a very good space mentally within his own head. I like his chances. I really do. But obviously, like I say, it's pointless talking about this stuff until you see you can only predict it so much because there'll be stuff that you can't predict how well people prepare. Like if he, however good headspace he's in, if he's got a lost position after 50 moves against Gukesh and Gukesh finds all the right moves... He's going to look, yeah. And I think the other fascinating thing, so I'm fascinated to see how Nakamura gets on. Sorry to keep going on because obviously you want to, but I'm also fascinated to see how Pragananda and Gukesh get on because I feel like they're like the future of chess. And then they're going to be in some of these candidate matches for many years to come. And I actually think with Pragananda that he's going to kind of have a very similar career trajectory to Magnus Carlsen and win lots and lots of world titles, not just at uh, classical chess, but also rapid and blitz. So I think he's going to be a dominant figure in the next few years. Oh, just one other thing. Yeah, Ferruja, I think you should mention as well, because Ferruja we have barely talked about, but actually Ferruja's form over the last few months has picked up. So Ferruja, another guy to talk about. But yeah, thanks a lot, Neil. Hopefully we'll have a bit more content during the... Uh, potentially after the, or even during the candidates itself. As I said at the start, it's a different level when you play these guys because you just feel the pressure when you play them. And, you know, they're phenomenal players. Like I've played players who are very, very strong players, but these guys are like, they are the best players in the world for a reason. They're just phenomenal. And you don't always see that because they play against each other, they neutralise each other and they play really well. And you don't see how strong they are because of the games... Like they just look like oh I play for that game and it just looks super accurate. But when you play them, you you feel their strength. Very interesting. Definitely a very dynamic, eclectic group of players. I think, as we said, I mean anything can happen, but should be very interesting. So Grandmaster Daniel Gormley, thank you so much for your insight. Yeah, no problem, mate. Yeah. For our listeners, we appreciate you tuning in, and as always, I hope you win your next game. Have a great week, everybody.